And about a month ago, we just decided to move to the city. For myself, it was a, a tough one. I, I, I quite enjoy living where I lived. It was a rural area, it was quiet, it was away from the cities, you know, it was, it was just very tranquil. But we're far from the amenities, we're far from um, some family, it was far from some friends. And so it just kind of felt led to move here. So we made this transition uh, this weekend. So uh, it's, been, it's been interesting. Anyways, it's been good to be here um, just in the last 48 hours. And as I've been thinking about what the Lord wants me to say this morning, I have a message in front of me right here. But in the last 48 hours, I feel like he's telling me to be more relational. And if you know me, I don't like to be relational. <laughs> I like to be more uh, verse by verse, very much context. What exactly is, is the Bible saying? And I'm going to just, I think because it's sort of a Frontier Lodge Sunday, because uh, we have a lot of the staff, at least I learned this last year, a lot of the staff has the opportunity in the summertime to get up and share a little bit of their life and their testimony. I'm going to do a little bit of the same leading into, I think, where my heart is uh, regarding camp. And so I want to start where my sister and I, who's here, and she's probably thinking, oh no, please don't associate with me this morning. But we grew up on, on Westcliff. Uh, I was probably about five, I think, when we moved here. And I spent the next nine years terrorizing, playing in the streets close by. Uh, one way to describe myself and my sister would be when I was in high school, uh, I guess so were you, we were both, probably both there, we both went to Emmanuel. My, our mother worked in the uh, staff room and she was overheard once just saying that she was very thankful for my sister, or for Heather, uh, because it restored her confidence in her motherhood. So, uh, <laughs> but I, I, I'm okay with it. So, so we, we grew up here. Uh, I. I grew up in a Christian home. Uh, my dad was a young minister. Some of you may know him, Alan Cameron. And I made a commitment when I was about 14. I was confirmed. But honestly, nothing really changed. Uh, I just went about my way doing whatever I was I enjoyed doing. Around 18, I went to a camp. Uh, actually, I think Al Heron was part of that with Jeff Simonek. And they, they kind of reached out to us in, in high school. And this is something I'm really appreciative for. I went to Emmanuel. And I went there because Lindsay Place and John Rennie wouldn't allow me there. Uh, so Emmanuel took me in. And if anything at the time, it really, uh, I think, kept my life from really going the, going the wrong direction. I think it put some parameters and some boundaries around me and protected me. And he brought people in like Al, and brought people in like Jeff, uh, Russ Hopkins. And at the very least, took me out skiing, so I wasn't out in trouble in the evening. And I, I think that was just a huge provision uh, in God's foresight, just uh, looking, out, looking out for me. From there, we, uh, we moved to NDG, and I went out west for, for work. I was uh, involved in tree planting. But two days before one of my seasons, I tore a rotator cuff and I couldn't start the season. So I ended up coming back and ended up, ended up at Jake Jackson's farm down in, in Ayers Cliff. And I didn't really know Jake. I hadn't been to Frontier Lodge. Uh, Terry LaPointe was working there that summer and a friend of uh, ours, Pascal, was there too and he was one inviting me down to, to spend some time there. So I, I went down there and uh, just kind of got to know the area a little bit. I heard Frontier, I got down there for a couple of things like youth conferences. I never went as a camper, never participated. And uh, one of these youth conferences, uh, we found ourselves down in the land of Canaan, or the town of Canaan, across the border, for, for those of you who know about this place. And I was struggling, I was starting to question who God was. I, I didn't doubt who he was, I, I believed he existed, I just didn't like him, I didn't like his plan, I didn't like a lot of the suffering I saw in the world, even though none of it affected me personally. I, I had a great upbringing. I had no reason to be angry, no reason to, to rage, no reason to be ups, upset with anything. And so it's just kind of a quiet pursuit. You feel like you're trying to put on one persona all the while you're asking these questions behind the scenes, but you didn't really know who to go to because you didn't want to let everybody down. But I didn't understand. So I went and saw him, and I tried to explain to him what I was struggling with. 
And he just looked at me and he goes, I hear you talking about this. I hear you going around and asking people these questions. Have you ever gone to God yourself and just said, hey, show me yourself, you know? Uh, answer these for me. And I looked at him and I was like, no, 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 I haven't done that. And uh, I said, quite frankly, I really don't want to talk to him. So I left and for, I guess, another few weeks, few months, uh, I just kind of kept stirring about this. And I was in this barn in a hayloft and I was throwing bales of hay down in the morning to feed these cows. And I'm throwing them, and I'm just getting angry. And I'm throwing them all over the, uh, the top of this hayloft. So they're bouncing off the walls. There's another guy down below. He's just kind of wondering what's going on up there. <laughs> and, and I just fell to my knees. I said, Lord, I don't get you. I don't understand you. Quite frankly, I don't want anything to do with you. But I'll give you my life. But just promise me you'll show me who you are. And I will do whatever it is you want me to do. When I was going back, uh, but I guess I was about 28 at that point. When I was 18 to 21, I played in a band uh, from Westview, or some guys from Westview, uh, Kim Reed, Scott Hargraves, it's called Innocent Blood. And Scott had taken a song from Psalm 86, verse 11. Teach me your way, O Lord, and I will walk in your truth. Give me an undivided heart that I may fear your name. Didn't mean much to me back then. But all of a sudden, that became my life verse. And so I just said, Teach me a way, Lord. Give me an undivided heart. Um, and so it went from there. So my sort of conversion, when you put off and we, there's um, repentance, there's forgiveness. <coughs> For me, it was just like, God, show me yourself. And that's where it started. Even though I'd grown up with the, the knowledge of who Jesus was and what he had done, I didn't really have an encounter with him. Someone suggested I go to Bible college. I was like, there's no money in Bible college. Like, what, am I, what kind of degree am I, am I going to get there? And so I went out there, and I was going to go out there for a year. And within the first week, I realized I'm going to be there for four or five years. I, I, I just had so many questions. And it was in the, it was in the first week. And this is, this is my personality at the time. So the first week, I'm in a class, and we're discussing free will. We're discussing uh, predestination. I had sort of grown up in a household that was very much predestination. So they're talking a lot about free will in this class. And I was like, well, this is a little bit disturbing to me. I don't understand. And I, I uh, approached the uh, professor after class. I said, so what's going on here? Uh, I kind of go with pre predestination, Ephesians 1, so on. And uh, I said, you're talking a lot about free will. Is that right? And he's like, well, yeah, there's an element there, for sure. And, uh, and I said, can you explain a little bit, a little bit more to me? Because I was looking for, which is it? One, one or the other? And he goes, well, I can't really say which one it is, for sure. He goes, what do you think? And I said, what do I think? I said, I just drove 3,000 kilometers, gave you guys a lot of money for you to tell me what I'm supposed to believe. <laughs> and so we actually became quite good friends. And it was just a place that I could really, I think, almost dismantle any type of theology that I had at the time, and then put it back brick by brick and begin to own it for myself. I eventually came back to a lot of the stuff I had grown up with, but I had to approach it, uh, approach it for myself. And so from there, um, you know, I began to uh, just, I think, encounter who Christ was. And it was really in a Gospels class. And we started to read Matthew. And you get through to chapter 1, and there's, you know, you just see the lineage. And chapter 2, and you have John, uh, John the Baptist, and uh, he's going around, he's preaching repentance. And Jesus comes in, and he's preaching repentance, too. And you flip the page, and you get to chapter 5. And all of a sudden... Here's Jesus' vision of the good life. And that's, Jesus, uh, and that's uh, you know, uh, verses 1 to 12 in chapter 5, the Beatitudes. And I started reading through this, and I'm looking, I'm looking, this is not the life I'm looking for. Like, for me, it was just like, I accept Christ, and I move on. Like, okay, I'm saved, I'm good to go. And I'm, I'm reading these, these Beatitudes, and this is not a life I want at all. I don't want to be any, anybody in that in, in those first lines, if you begin to read them. I, I like the second part of the Beatitude, but not the first part. But the second part serves as the motivation for the, for the first part. And so as I began to um, grapple with this and appreciate this, I got to watch the way Matthew uh, delivers his version of Jesus' life. And you, and you see him go through Matthew 5, 6, and 7, you have the Sermon on the Mount, and then you have him in, in chapter 9, 
And in chapter 9, he has a dilemma uh, over the breaking of bread. And he's doing this with sinners. And he gets called on it. And, and he responds by saying, I did not come to... Uh, uh, I did not come for the healthy, but for the sick. Um, and if you're slow like myself, he reinterprets it by saying, I came for the sinners, not, not the righteous. And who were the righteous? Well, at the time there were the Pharisees that thought um, they, they were doing everything, the letter of the law. He reflects on that by going back to Hosea. He says, um, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Go and learn what this means. So I'm looking at this, and I'm thinking, okay, one of the Beatitudes is, you know, um, uh, blessed are, uh, are those who are merciful, for they will be shown mercy. And I see him acting as this, and all of a sudden it becomes this huge umbrella for me that everything that God has done and initiated uh, is done under this umbrella of mercy. It's his sending his son. Yes, um, uh, faith, grace, all part of it, but it's all under the umbrella of mercy. How he's, uh, how he's displayed it on us. As I go further and I see chapter 12, and particularly chapter 18, the, uh, the two debtors, I, I, I'm, I'm not reading these stories right now, I'm just telling you, because I think the majority of you know these stories, but you have this one debtor who owes the king a lot of money. Uh, it's basically uh, an insurmountable sum that he can never begin to think about repaying. And this story works on two levels. There is the initial servant and the king, but the king reflects or represents God. And, um, and this person goes to the king and begs for mercy, saying, I can't repay you. Or he goes, I will try to repay you, but have mercy on me. And the king offers him mercy and says, your debt is, is clear. And so this person leaves rejoicing. Meanwhile, he meets somebody else that owes him another sum of money. Nothing compared to what he owed the king. But he, when this other person asks for mercy and repayment of that debt, won't offer it back to him. And so the king hears about this and, and, and basically says, weren't you not supposed to offer mercy to anybody else you encounter? And so I'm looking at this, and I, I reflect on my, my life growing up, and it was very much, again, just repentance, faith, you're done. And then how you lived your life as a Christian was determined by trivial, not trivial things, but things that, um, okay, I got up in the morning, I read my Bible, I was a good Christian. I stopped swearing, I was a good Christian. I didn't listen to a certain type of music, I, I didn't watch a certain type of movie. These made me grow closer to, to God. Uh, no. God's not going to love you any more or any less based on on, on those things. He sees you through what Christ did. That's great. And that's out of his mercy. That's um, his gracious initiative that he, he bestowed upon us. Um, and so, as, as, I'm, as I'm realizing these things, uh, this is, by the way, why I like to stick to what I write down. Um, but what I, I, I want to communicate is faithfulness to God is to show, your, to show how faithful you are to God comes down to whether or not you're going to offer mercy to those around you, whether or not you're going to offer forgiveness to those around you, no matter what they've done to you. It we become so uh, just in our own thinking that I'm, I'm a good person because I've done all these different things. Uh, we're almost like um, Paul reflects on the beginning of Romans. And, you know, you want to, you want to hold to your, your lineage. Uh, we sort of hold to what we think we're doing, and that's what finds favor with God. We need to offer mercy. We need to offer forgiveness. Um, how can you come, you have the breaking of bread at 9.30. How can you come to the breaking of bread when you're holding bitterness uh, towards somebody else? When you feel that somebody has wronged you? How can you come and remember what Christ has done for you when you're holding that against someone else? Our actions, in my mind, truly display what we thoroughly believe. Um, mercy for me was the beginning of understanding God's whole plan. In His mercy, He gave us Christ. Um, in His mercy, through grace, um, and our, 
we, we can place our faith in Him and trust Him with our lives. Um, it's funny. I, I woke up this morning and I, and I was just pacing our new apartment. And I was just really struggling with what I wanted to communicate this morning, what I felt God was trying to uh, say to everybody here. But this is the most impactful thing in my life. It's, it's, it, for me, it's, I think it's not the, um, what is the word I'm trying to, I'm trying to describe? Um, for me, I think it's just, it's just recognizing uh, how abhorrent, how dirty, how dark our, our hearts become. It's, it's recognizing how much I need Christ. It's how much I need Him uh, to save me. There is nothing I can possibly do. Um, I, I hardly really want to just go to this, but it's... Uh, I'm not sure if I should do it. Look, at the end of the day, what I want to cultivate at Frontier is, is mercy, and forgiveness, and grace. I want people to come there to experience that. Um, I want us to be the dispensers um, for Christ, for our Savior uh, at Frontier. I want them to come there and feel completely, uh, come, come as they are not feel like they have to get anywhere to be loved by God, to be loved by uh, Christ. Um, it's going to cost you your life, for sure, if you give it back to Him. I mean, the Bible's clear about that. It's going to cost you your life. It is not an easy road. If you were to bow your head right now and pray, Lord, allow me to demonstrate your mercy to those around me, you are going to have a miserable month ahead of you. I, I, I promise you that. Everything will become right in front of your eyes. Your spouses, your kids, your job, those who you work with, your friends, everything is going to bother you. And what are you going to do? You're going to turn and you're going to offer mercy. You're going to uh, forgive them. Because why? Because Christ first initiated that with you and forgave you. If you really want to show him, if you really want to show him, um, you are faithful to him. Turn and offer mercy. Turn and offer forgiveness uh, to your neighbor, to your uh, your spouse, to your son and daughter, to your parents. Um, it, that beatitude comes right after, uh, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. It's interesting that it comes right before that. Because, it's sobering, because when I really first gave my life to the Lord, I was very much, I want to do everything by the letter of the law. And sometimes people ask, you know, who's your favorite person in the Bible? I'll go to the Pharisees, because unfortunately that's who I, I have a tendency to relate to. Uh, there's something about them. I know I've probably been that person back then. Uh, I'm a person of extremes. I'm either all in or all out. I don't know how to do the in-between. And so, I'm not sure if this is clear. This message actually was on mercy, and I have it. Yeah, everything here is edited the way I feel like I'm supposed to do it. For whatever reason, I don't know why I was supposed to go this route. Um, but, uh, look, this is what I want from you to be a place, again. I just want it to be a place where people can come and experience God's grace, God's mercy. That they can engage and asking questions, uh, who he is, what is his purpose in this world, it goes well beyond just the initial part of um, uh, faith and repentance. That's the starting point. He wants to do a work in this world. He wants to transform this world. He wants to use you to do it. Um, but to do it is going to cost you your life. But if you see the motivation behind the first line, and blessed are those, you'll see that the kingdom is going to be your life when it's all said and done. So, um, I'm not quite going to leave it at that. I want to uh, recognize one person uh, this, this morning.
um, Matthew Kaufman. He was a counselor last year. And we had one evening where there was sickness rampaging, rampaging through camp. And Trish and I were coming back from, uh, it was called the chalet. We're walking down, it was just before 11 o'clock at night. We had, uh, um, what were we using to spray down the, the wipes? The Lysol wipes. So we were spraying down this, 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 this place and uh, just trying to get rid of the germs. And Matthew Kaufman comes running over uh, this, the circle. What's the circle in front of the ship? The oval. The oval. So he comes, I can't think of anything right now. So he comes running over there and he's like, Timber, Timber, that's my cabinet. And he goes, he mentioned the person in his cabin that just gave his life to the Lord. And he's just rejoicing. And I'm walking down and I'm thinking to myself, it's 10 to 11. Okay, what did I just sign up for? I'm, I'm you know, wiping down this cabin. I'm not sure this is what's going on. And I see him and I'm like, that's exactly what we signed up for. It's to have that, it's to have that impact. Uh, Matt Coppin <coughs> is the person that Trish and I have selected uh, for the James Wilson Award. Today, uh, we wouldn't make that announcement here just simply because uh, it's here. I don't know him personally, but I've heard an incredible amount of, uh, of things about him and how he just had an impact on those around him. Uh, so, that is the person. He just, he just rose above it. Uh, I gave him a lot of leeway. He kept coming back to me. He's, Do I have to go by these certain rules in terms of running my cabin? And I'm like, no you don't. I just want you to go in there and I want you to love these kids. Make sure they're safe, make sure they're secure, but just love these kids. Some of them are coming from different, different backgrounds. They have a whole other level of of understanding to, to discipline and uh, just make sure when they leave they, they've experienced God's grace, make sure they've experienced God's love. And his, his cabin, the kids in there, I used to call them just a whole bunch of Kaufmans, uh, if, you, if you know this person. And uh, it was just incredible to watch him just rise to the challenge every day. Uh, one of the criteria, I was looking at that again this morning on, on our website, was not to have an effect on others but not to be affected by others. Just no matter what they say to you, no matter what they do to you, you just get up in the morning and you impact others for Christ because you're living out what Christ has asked you to do. And so we just saw him do that. And it was, uh, it was quite remarkable. And he's off right now on a missions trip, uh, I believe in Australia. So he doesn't know he's, he's sort of won this. But uh, we're going to make an announcement via Facebook later this afternoon. But we wanted you here to be the first to, to know. So that's who we've chosen. And um, just ask him, it sounds like we've made a, a pretty good choice. So, so this morning, if you would just bow with me for a minute, and uh, please pray for this summer. Uh, we, I, I don't, I'm pumped for it. I'm excited for the people that I see coming in, signing up, for the people that are going to be involved with camp this summer. I'm excited to work with the staff. I'm excited to walk alongside them. Uh, I want them to see that we're going to ask them to do things that they will probably struggle with. Well, here you go. Here you go. I'm, I'm the first one this morning to, to say, hey, I'm, I'm, having a, I'm having a hard time. I'm really trying to follow what the Lord is wanting me to say here. And even though it's all right here, I... Anyway, so, would you please bow with me? Father, this morning we just want to invite you just through your word and through your spirit, uh, and, and to not allow me to, to be a hindrance, what you're trying to say to everybody here. Um, you've worked in this world because of your mercy, and under that umbrella, it's, it's through your grace and, your, and, and just offering forgiveness. Uh, may you prepare the hearts of all of us in here to continue to respond to that, to help us understand a more full gospel. As we go forth into the summer, may you just uh, over, oversee camp uh, and also prepare the hearts of those who will be serving you as it will be trials and tribulations. Uh, just give them the wisdom, what to, what to say, what to share, uh, how to love those kids, how to offer them grace, how to encourage them, how to build them up, how to relate what you've done in their lives to them. And may you prepare the hearts of those, those campers that they will see you that they will begin to understand who you are, uh, that you do have a purpose for them, that you do have a purpose in this world, that you want to transform this world, uh, and you want to begin by doing it with, with them. Uh, Father, continue to show yourself to us, and um, we just ask this in your Son's name. Amen.